Would you please turn with me to Romans chapter 5, and we will read verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. We find our text in the middle of Paul's most systematic presentation of the gospel. Having first shown his readers their universal guilt before God in chapters 1 and 2, Paul then moved uh, to chapters 3 and 4 and set forth Jesus Christ as the only way to get right with God. And as hopefully many of us today know, that way is justification by faith. Our guilt for sin against God can only be fully removed if we trust Jesus' death on the cross to be sufficient payment for our sins. And yet Paul does not end his gospel presentation in chapter 4, but he moves on beyond that. Because after we believe, life goes on, and as Christians, we have continually have questions about our faith. Questions like, if I am justified, can I live now how I want to? If Christ did the work that was necessary, shouldn't I just relax and enjoy my life? Or on the other end of the extreme, we might have questions like, well, if Christ did the work needed, shouldn't I, and, and I'm counted right with God, how do I stay that way? How do I earn his continuing saving favor? In fact, the first set of questions could be label, labeled uh, or fall under the label of antinomianism, while the second set of questions is often described as that of legalism. And yet Paul how, looks at this and says no as he walks us into chapter 5. Here he presents a radically different view and different image of life justified before God. Before he goes on then to flesh out other Christian doctrines in subsequent chapters, Paul shows the powerful effect that justification has on a person. And therefore, in, chapters, in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, he gives us three fruits of justification. Those fruits flow naturally from the removal of our guilt before God and Hopefully, Lord willing, we will spend the rest of our time today looking at these fruits, namely our peace with God, our standing in grace, and our rejoicing in glory. Our peace with God, our standing in grace, and our rejoicing in glory. First, we look at our peace with God. And I want to begin by saying what this peace is not. Because oftentimes, and many times in the Bible, we see that by describing something negatively, what it isn't, that allows us to see clearer what it is. So first, this piece is not licensed to sin. And Paul makes this point numerous times in his writings. And in the very epistle to Romans, in chapter 3, we read, But if righteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? By no means. And later in chapter 6, he says, Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. This peace is not meant to numb your and mine consciences. So we could do whatever we like. This was the Roman Catholic Church's assessment. If people can do nothing to help their salvation then they will have no incentive to obey God and the church. In other words, no fear of punishment, or no, no, no fear of loss, of salvation, 
equals no obedience. This is not, however, how Paul sees it. He is assured of this peace that we have with God, but he is so without even a hint of antinomianism. And thus, this peace is not a license to sin. But then, it, this peace is also primarily not subjective. This notion goes against the modern idea of peace of mind, of oneness with the universe and the like. All those ways to describe peace and balance look within. This peace is not based, however, on how you or I feel about God, but on the fact that God considers you to be a saint. So now, if peace with God does not free us to live however we want, and it isn't rooted in our subjective experiences, naturally then we can ask, well, what is it? What is this peace? And let us next do exactly that. Let's look at what this peace that Paul is talking about is. First, it is the removal of alienation from God. It is the removal of alienation from God. You might remember Genesis 3, that chapter where before it man used to fellowship with God pre-fall. To walk with him in the garden, but in verse 10 of that chapter, after the man, after the man sinned, here is what he said. I heard the sound of you, that is God, in the garden, and I was afraid, and because, because I was naked, and I hid myself. That very moment, the creature, creator creature, this intimacy was lost. And ever since, loneliness is our constant companion. But not only have we been alienated from our maker, the sovereign Lord, but also from other people around us. We see this most clearly in death. However we hard we try, we will always die alone. And so in that context, peace with God then means restoration of what was lost and more. As Christians now, we can be sure that we are no longer ever alone. Think of it this way. Lock us up in a solitary confinement and God is still with us. The reality that Paul is setting before us is that we are never again alone. God is not distant. He is with us. He's close. He's nearby. But then the second thing is that this peace constitutes a new relationship. So not only does it remove something, but it brings something new and it adds something that wasn't there before. And this word with in verse 1, with God, carries precisely that meaning. It is not spatial in the sense that we are with, at peace when we are with God, which surely as Christians we know that that is true, but this particular instance is giving us a different idea, an idea of entering into a relationship with someone, someone of entering before someone, of being on a trajectory that we have not been before, that we are now moving and approaching God. This speaks of intimacy, of intimacy that is once more available, the same intimacy that was lost in the Garden of Eden. What is more, this new relationship comes with tremendous implications. Just think about it. Once enemies with God, now we are called his children. Where once was fear of death and judgment, there is now confidence and trust in the Lord. There is courage. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in the same epistle to Romans, in cha chapter 8, will say the same thing, saying, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
This is where I think uh, the Roman Catholics miss it. Christian faith is not supposed uh, to be driven by fear, shouldn't be driven by fear. There is a much, much more powerful force at work. And that force is the saving love of God. This is why Paul, in his other epistle, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, so boldly says, And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We all know that fear can only get us so far in a relationship. It might keep us in line for some time. But true, lasting change, permanent devotion is only available and is only possible in a loving relationship. And if that's true with us, between other people, how much more is this true with God? And so we, what we see here is that we are no longer God's foes, but his friends. No longer his enemies, but his children, his beloved. Third, even though this piece is not primarily subjective, as we have seen, nonetheless, it should shape our experience. The objective reality of peace should result in peaceful mind and heart. In other words, we should expect to live, at, to be at peace. We can expect emotional balance, but the difference is the source, where it comes from. The world says well, that we should look within, or we should look at things, or we should look at other people. Yet Paul tells us that this experience, that what's shaping our experience is the fact of our peace with God. Which brings us to our, its last aspect. This peace comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. The means by which this peace is acquired is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is Paul bringing this up again? Hasn't he just mentioned justification by faith? Isn't he re literally just finishing writing for two chapters about that very thing? So why is Paul bringing this up again? And the answer I, I, I want to suggest is that we are so prone to affirm it in theory and forget it in practice. Let me state that again. We are so prone to affirm these, this means in theory and forget it in practice. Think about your instinct when you sin. If only I feel enough remorse, if, if only I feel sorry enough, then the Lord will surely see it and he will pardon if he forgives me this time, then I will never do this again. I will try my best to never fall into this again. What are we doing when we say these things, when we think these thoughts? We are trying to earn our peace. We are looking for ways to restore our sense of peace with God as fast as we can to return, as it were, to the state of balance. Again, Paul challenges us. And says, this is not what he wants us to do. He wants us to see that our peace with God is rooted in objective reality. When our insufficiency is before us, when our disobedience and sin threaten our sense of peace with God, we are being called to remember the work of Christ. He was sufficient. He obeyed the law of God perfectly. He paid for our sins fully. Friends, that is the objective reality written, engraved in the pages of history. Reality that no emotional state of ours can ever undo and can ever challenge. But now, some of us might validly ask, what if I don't experience this peace? What if I lose it? 
can I lose it? What if I um, don't see it? It's all good and well that Christ died and was raised in history, but what if I am not able to own it? What if I'm not able to live up to it? What, uh, how can I know that this objective reality belongs to me and does so permanently? How do I not keep looking back over my shoulder time and time again to see whether I'm saved or not? And these questions, these bring us to the second point, to the second fruit of justification. That fruit is our standing in God's grace. It is as if Paul, anticipating all these questions, all these doubts, goes bigger and wider. Like an experienced salesman, he says, but wait, there is more. Through him, that is Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That's Paul's words. And in those words, we see three things, three things under this blessing, its privilege, its permanence, and its scope. Let's start with privilege. We have obtained access, Paul says. And the assumption here that we get something that we didn't have before. Whatever this grace is, we had no way of getting in. We were outside of it. And in that sense, the word access then sets a certain image before us. As one commentator said, an image of a friend who secures for you an audience with a king. Obviously, something undeserved. That's the privilege. And Christ is that friend. Notice, however, that for the second time in two verses, uh, Paul mentions faith. This is how the privilege is obtained. It is true, when, you, when, we, when we think about it, it is true that without the saving faith, historical reality of Jesus' death and resurrection is of little consolation. It's a fact. In fact, not only that, but it is a sure sentence and verdict of judgment. So faith is crucial. Faith is crucial. Crucial faith is how this privilege becomes ours. And that's why Paul keeps mentioning it time and time again. He knows that when you and I don't feel at peace with God, when our sin confronts us, we are so, so prone to look at our insufficiency rather than Christ's sufficiency. This is where our doubts come from. One thing sin does so well is take our eyes off of Christ and place them on us. And surely many of us here today have experienced those doubts about our faith. This is how I would phrase them in my life. I see all these faithful believers, spiritual giants. I see their piety, their strong faith, yet I don't see the same thing. I don't find the same thing in myself. And then naturally it goes, am I actually saved? But what's happening in those moments? In those moments, friends, our focus is always on us, isn't it? Are you enough? In other words, what you're saying is, how much faith merits salvation? But again, you are thinking in terms of what you have done. Paul, in contrast, wants you to look at Christ. It is the object you see of your salvation, of your faith, that matters in these moments of doubt. It is not its strength. In Colossians 1, 19 and 20, we read, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by, his blood, by the blood of his cross. That is why the apostle is so clear. This privilege is yours by faith. The good news is you do indeed have access to God, to his grace through Christ. But the wonderful thing of this privilege and about it is that it is permanent. Think of it as a one-way door. It only opens from the outside, and once you're in, you're in. 
In Philippians 1, verse 6, Paul says, And I am sure of this, that he who began good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And as Paul says, we stand firmly. We stand in this grace. The verb stand in Greek comes in a perfect tense, which is significant in the following way. It, is, it means that we experience a present and permanent result of a past event, of something that has been done in the past, the result of which we experience today, and that result lasts into the future. And surely we know that this event took place at the cross. And this event is the solid ground on which we firmly stand by faith. And this is where neither antinomianism nor legalism gets it. Antinomianism claims that our salvation is so sure that it really, really doesn't matter how we live. It is true that as Christians, sins, our sins no longer condemn us, but antinomianism fails to see that its claim can only be made by a heart that is unaffected by grace and therefore has never experienced it. And legalism underappreciates the same power of grace as well because it sees it as unable to produce a response of obedience. So you see, both see the um, permanence as license to do whatever we wish. And only the Holy Spirit can open our eyes to see the permanence the way the Bible sees it. As life-changing, worship-inducing, obedience-cultivating reality. And then, to privilege and permanence, Paul adds scope. He takes our eyes off us and puts them back on Christ. And he also takes our focus off just peace with God and widens it so we could see the whole panorama of God's grace. Not only do you receive full justification through and through it, peace with God, but every blessing that the church receives through Christ, you receive also. As we read in Ephesians 1, where Paul, the same Paul, says, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, been ble who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This, friends, brings us to the third and final fruit of justification. The central thread of the larger passage of Romans 5, 1, 11, the fruit that explains the first two, that is our joy in the hope of future glory. Hope is often called a mother of fools, in which sense it is understood as expecting something so unreasonable, so improbable that only a fool could do it. But this is not how the Bible's idea of hope is presented. Rather, it is best described as looking forward to something with some reason for confidence respecting fulfillment. Looking forward to something with some reason for confidence respecting fulfillment. Is it, it is the exact opposite of foolish expectation. And you might, might ask, well, why? Why is it the way, uh, why can we say that? And the answer is because of the Father's consistent faithfulness. In fact, a few verses below, Paul confirms this, saying that hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so we see that God, through redemptive history, has remained faithful to his covenant promises. He has brought, us, brought so many prophesied things to fulfillment. He sent Christ the Redeemer and Holy Spirit the Helper. He has preserved his church through centuries and still does. To illustrate this, think of the sun. We expect the sun to rise every morning. Why? Because of our past experiences. In this sense, the sun could be said to be faithful in rising every morning. 
But how much more is that true of the Lord? Listen to the words from Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? It is thus most reasonable for us to expect and to be confident in God's word, in a word which promises a glorious future for those who believe in Christ. In fact, everything that, that we have now in Christ, everything that we know and have in Christ is inevitably tied and flows from that future. Let us think about this. What did Jesus accomplish for us on the cross? Justification. What is justification? It is our righteous standing based on his work before the Father. But it is so on the final day of judgment. Whatever peace we have with God today, we do so because of our future acquittal. Whatever grace we stand in now, we do so because of receiving Christ's merit as our own on the day of judgment. This is why Jude speaks so boldly of the Lord as the one who is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. The very first thing God's glory in Romans 5.2 means is exactly that. The ability to withstand God's judgment. But the point is, you not only, it is not only the ability to withstand it, but you rejoice and appreciate the fairness of that judgment. Furthermore, if we think uh, that the, the way, of the ways Christians are to live with life's challenges and remaining sin, it is always in light of future glorification. When Christ, as Paul says in Colossians, uh, Colossians 3, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You will have a glorified body and soul, immune to sin, pain, and suffering. That completely transforms how you live in the present. Or think of your relationship with Christ now. It all points to the eternal future with the same Lord Jesus Christ. And this, John makes this point in 1 John uh, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when we, he has appeared, we shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. So whatever we have today with Christ, it is in light of that hope that one day we shall see him as he is. And what I'm trying to say and what I'm saying is simply this, that your destination matters. If you are on a boat or a ship, how you handle your journey, especially if it's a long journey, a taxing journey, depends very much on where you expect to land on where you expect to set your foot once the journey is over. It shapes your attitude, perseverance, resilience, determination. All those depend on what is waiting for you at the end of your traveling. So what is waiting for you? Where are you traveling? If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, it is the glory of God. Fear and anxiety will be gone. Doubt and insecurity will be done with. Illness and weakness will no longer follow you. And every earthly injustice will be set aright. Yet most importantly, you will be able to withstand God's judgment. Friends, this is your assurance. This is the fruit of your justification, and this is your hope. But we have to ask, so what? 
how does that affect how we live today? What does it mean for us today? Notice that Paul is not giving us imperative, but imperatives but indicatives. What he's saying is that we have peace, that we, have, uh, that we stand in grace, that we rejoice in hope. He is not des- describing some wishful thinking, something in the future. Rather, he's giving us, he's setting before us the realities of Christian experience. And yet, we see that our lives so very often are lacking this very confidence and assurance that Paul presents before us. And now we ask how? How then do we bridge the the gap? How do we live lives that match Paul's description more? And I want to set before you five applications, five considerations that I think answer that question. Consider the cross, shift your focus, understand justification, enjoy the privileges of grace, and respond in worship. First, consider the cross. Christ's perfect fulfillment of God's law before crucifixion grants you justification. His condemnation in crucifixion results in your acquittal. He had to bear the wrath of God so you could have peace with God. He was forsaken so you could be welcomed into God's family. He experienced the hopelessness of hell so you could receive the hope of God's glory. And then, coming from that, shift your focus. We know that when we doubt our inheritance in Christ, it is always because we look at ourselves. Do I really believe? Can this sin be pardoned? Surely, I have done this so many times that I am beyond forgiveness. But friends, you will not find assurance there. You are not meant to find assurance there. It is in Christ that your strength and your hope rests in his faithfulness, in his perseverance, in his power. So when in doubt, shift your focus to him. Shift your focus to him and consider the object of your faith, not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith. And say with Micah, but as for me, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation and my God will hear me. Thirdly, understand justification. As we have seen You will either be tempted to earn your salvation by good works or deny the necessity of holy living altogether. Either of these two misses the point of true true justification. Instead of doing either one or the other, look and delight precisely in the irrevocable grace and love of God Asking him that this reality would enable you to think, to speak, and to live in greater obedience to the Lord. All that out of gratitude for so great a gift. Now fourthly, enjoy the privileges of grace. Our standing in grace, the second blessing of today's passage, reminds us that Doubt narrows our vision and makes us selective. If I don't feel peace with God, then surely something must be wrong. Surely I don't have salvation. Surely I'm not a Christian. But it, is, it, is that all that is in faith? Is God's grace only giving you peace with him? That's where you become selective. That's where you become narrow. And yet God's grace has a scope that is so wide. And so I call you to remember his faithfulness recorded in scripture. To remember his faithfulness in your life. To remember your brothers and sisters that the Lord has given you. And if you are the brother and the sister, this is also the call to you. 
to remember your calling as brothers and sisters and to walk with one another, bearing one another's burdens. Remember, above all, your all-seeing and all-knowing Lord and confess your doubts to him in prayer and wait on him to reassure your peace. And lastly, but very importantly, respond in worship. Paul literally is saying this. We glory in the hope of God's glory. We are ecstatic. We rejoice. We worship. We delight. This is not something that we just pass by. This is life transforming. This is worship and praise and honor inducing in our hearts. Our future reality shouldn't be just future reality. It should pour into our lives, stirring us up to praise and thank our Lord for what he has done in Jesus Christ. And so I want to end by reading from Hebrews 12, verse 28. Leave us with this. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and reverence.